Welcome to the next installation of the Pen Pet videos, pulmonary and critical care evidence-based medicine topics. Today, we are going to discuss biologic therapies used in the treatment of severe asthma. We'll quickly review the guidelines and the important pathophysiology of asthma, and then discuss the relevant clinical trials guiding our management strategy. At the end of the video, we will bring it all together to application in clinical care of patients with severe asthma. Treatment of asthma is guided by the step-up paradigm outlined by the Gold Initiative for Asthma or GINA guidelines. Deciding a patient's starting step and when to set up therapy is based on a variety of clinical factors, including the use of albuterol, nighttime symptoms, hospitalizations, and FEV1, among others. Therapy can be increased stepwise, starting with as-needed short-acting beta agonists, or SABA alone, up to high-dose ICS LABA therapy. As you move up the steps, other therapies may be added, including the option to add LAMA therapy at step 4 and above. Once at the top of the staircase, patients are prescribed high-dose ICS LABA, LAMA, and other adjunctive therapies. Many of these patients also require chronic oral steroids, which we try to avoid. You may be left wondering, what other options exist to keep people with severe asthma from needing chronic oral steroids? Thankfully, Recent pharmacologic advances have provided new options for these patients at the top of the staircase. Biologic humanized monoclonal antibodies. These agents target several important molecules or receptors implicated in the pathophysiology of asthma. So before we dive into the evidence, let's take a moment to review the mechanism and the pathobiologic features of asthma and the role of biologic therapies. First off, asthma can be subdivided into two phenotypes based on the predominant type of inflammation involved. These are eosinophilic asthma, which is mediated by helper T cells, and non-eosinophilic asthma. The therapies that we will be talking about today focus on the eosinophilic endotype, which accounts for about 50% of asthmatic patients. In eosinophilic asthma, type 2 inflammation is initiated by exposure to an antigen, such as pet dander. This then stimulates a helper T cell to produce various interleukins, including IL-4, 5, and 13. One of these signals, IL-5, stimulates the production of eosinophils. Helper T cells also release IL-4, which stimulates B cells to produce immunoglobulin E, or IgE, which bind to mast cells, ultimately causing the release of a host of chemokines like histamine. Both the mast cell contents, which were released due to IgE, and eosinophils, which were stimulated by IL-5, lead to the hyperresponsiveness, smooth muscle constriction, mucus production, and hypertrophy that we characteristically see in asthma. Now that we've reviewed the relevant pathophysiology, let's return back to the biologic agents that we can use in asthma, omalizumab and mepolizumab. Omalizumab targets the IgE molecule, preventing it from facilitating the release of chemokines from the mast cell, as indicated by the letter O on the screen. Mepolizumab targets IL-5, preventing the increase of eosinophils in the airway, as indicated by the letter M on the screen. Let's take a closer look at the clinical trials supporting these agents. The trials we will cover today include the Innovate and Extra trial for omalizumab, and the Mensa and Sirius trial for mepolizumab, each providing important evidence for the use of these biologic therapies for the treatment of severe persistent asthma. Let's start by reviewing the evidence for omalizumab. The Innovate trial, published in Allergy in 2005, assessed the effectiveness of omalizumab as add-on therapy in patients with severe persistent asthma. This was a randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind study conducted in 419 patients. The primary outcome of the study was the rate of clinically significant asthma exacerbations. After an eight-week run-in period, patients who were uncontrolled on high-dose ICS therapy and LABA therapy were randomized to either 28 weeks of subcutaneous omalizumab or placebo, followed by a 16-week follow-up phase. Inclusion criteria for the study required patients be on high-dose ICS and LABA, with an FEV1 between 40 and 80% of predicted, with evidence of perennial allergen and elevated IgE levels. They found decreased asthma exacerbations, decreased severe exacerbations, decreased ED visits, and improved asthma-related quality of life in those receiving omalizumab. More data supporting the use of omalizumab was provided by the EXTRA trial, published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2011. This was a randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind study conducted in 800 patients with inadequately controlled severe persistent allergic asthma already on both high-dose ICS and LABA. The primary outcome of this study was the rate of clinically significant asthma exacerbations. Similar to the Innovate trial, 
Enrolled patients were aged 12 to 75 with severe persistent allergic asthma not controlled on both an ICS and LAVA. After a two to four week run-in phase, patients received 48 weeks of either subcutaneous omalizumab or placebo. Enrolled patients had to have IgE levels between 30 and 700 and an FEV1 of 40 to 80%. Ultimately, the investigators found decreased asthma exacerbations, the primary outcome, as well as improved asthma symptom scores in the omalizumab group. While these results, confirmed in several other studies, support the use of omalizumab in severe persistent asthma, it is important to note that the use of omalizumab continues to be limited by significant cost, as was addressed in subsequent economic analysis. Another biologic agent used in the treatment of allergic asthma is mepolizumab, which targets a different component of the asthma pathway, specifically IL-5. Remember, IL-5 is an important factor signaling eosinophils to the airways. Two important studies that address the clinical impact of this biologic agent are the MENSA trial and the SIRIUS trial, both published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2014. The MENSA trial aimed to assess whether the use of mepolizumab would decrease the need for frequent oral steroids in patients with severe asthma. This study was a multi-center, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study of about 600 patients with inadequately controlled severe persistent asthma. The primary outcome was the frequency of asthma exacerbations. After a run-in period, patients received either mepolizumab 75 mg intravenously, mepolizumab 100 mg subcutaneously, or placebo for a 32-week treatment period, followed by an additional 8-week monitoring period. The study included those ages 12 to 82 with severe persistent asthma not controlled on high-dose ICS and LABA inhalers, and importantly, a peripheral eosinophil count of at least 150 or at least 300 in the prior year. In terms of the primary outcome, they found a statistically significant decrease in the number of asthma exacerbations in enrolled patients. They also found an increase in FEV1, an improvement in symptoms, and equivocal adverse events in the mepolizumab group as compared to placebo. In the same edition of the New England Journal of Medicine, the SIRIUS trial aimed to answer if mepolizumab could reduce the need for chronic oral steroids for patients with severe persistent asthma. In this multi-center, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study, investigators enrolled 135 patients with inadequately controlled severe persistent asthma on chronic maintenance oral steroids, ranging from 5 to 35 mg of prednisone per day. The primary outcome assessed was the reduction in steroid dose. After a run-in period, patients uncontrolled on inhalers or oral corticosteroids were randomized to either mepolizumab 100 mg subcutaneously or placebo for a 24-week treatment period, followed by an additional six-week monitoring period. Similar to the MENSA study, authors enrolled those with a peripheral eosinophil count of at least 150, or at least 300 in the prior year. In terms of the primary outcome, they found a statistically significant reduction in oral steroid dose, as well as a reduced rate of annual asthma exacerbations and improved asthma symptoms. Notably, there was no difference in complete cessation of oral corticosteroid use between the placebo and the mepolizumab arms. Regardless, this study provided evidence that mepolizumab may be beneficial to reduce the dosing of chronic steroids in patients with severe persistent asthma. Okay, let's review what we've learned today. We now know we have several options to offer patients with severe persistent asthma who are already on optimal therapy. If they have an IgE greater than 30, consider omalizumab, based on the Innovate and EXTRA trials. If they have an eosinophil count greater than 300 and have had multiple exacerbations in the past year, consider mepolizumab, based on Mensa or Sirius. Future studies may provide guidance for which biologic therapy to use in patients with both an elevated IgE and eosinophil count. That concludes our brief review for the evidence supporting various biologic therapies for asthma. Thanks for listening.